Okay, <clears throat> hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Old Guy with a Joystick. Uh, I am playing Stash again tonight, which is a, uh, an up-and-coming MMORPG. Uh, I'm very excited about it. It has kind of this neat retro feel where your model uh, of a guy is actually kind of like a 40 millimeter figurine on a base, which is pretty cool for those of us who grew up in the old school tabletop gaming environment. <clears throat> so, uh, I am enjoying this thoroughly, and I'm going to work tonight on uh, doing some gameplay for you, and I'm going to uh, try to level the character up a bit, do some crafting, get into a few fights, maybe get smushed a little bit, and generally give an idea of what the game is all about. Um, so, uh, one thing that's really great about this game is that the developers are really, really involved with the community. And if you take a look at the chat here, there's a guy named Snarlax, and he is the lead developer. You can see he's actually involved right now in talking to people. He's inviting me to uh, post in the forum to try and uh, get more people watching. So, they're very supportive of their players, which is really cool. So, let's get started here. Well... The character I'm playing right now is an elementalist, which is your typical booga booga wizard type. And um, they cast spells and do all that kind of good stuff as their main way of inflicting ouch on bad guys. Uh, she is also a crafter. She makes potions. Uh, she can build tools and such and make enchantments for other people's stuff. Right now I've got a trap out here that is uh, going to catch me what amounts to a chicken in the game called a paka because I'm going to stick it in my coop and harvest its eggs. And eventually, when I get tired of it, it will meet a gruesome end as I, uh, you know, uh, well, not to put too fine a point on it, but I put it on the chopping block and turn it into yummy yummies. So, poor Paka. He has a short lifespan ahead of him, but it will be very useful for me, so I'm going to be hardcore about my Paka farming. So, I've got a couple of Pakas here. I went into my base of operations, I clicked on the chicken coop, and I am going to collect these eggs. This little life bar on these pockets is running out, so we're going to put them to the knife. Bloop! One down. Okay, I got a little bit of meat and some leather. I don't really know how you get a lot of leather off of a tiny little red chicken, but hey, who am I to question how it works? And I'll collect all those resources. Oh no, my stash is full. I have to make a little room. But I'll put two more pockets in. Why? Because I'm just like that, and that should clear out room in the stash. And now I can collect all that stuff. <clears throat> okay, fantastic. Now I'll look in the little orchard. I have a couple of uh, trees growing here. Let's see, I have apple trees going right now, so I'll pick up the apples. And then I will go to the little garden where, if memory serves, I have some carrots and some wheat growing. Which I do, so I will collect all of that as well. All right, so that deals with gathering all the resources that I have. And I recommend that everybody who log in, once you have your crafting stuff set up, that you remember to collect all these things. Because the pacas and the trees and the plants, they all have a limited lifespan. So if you don't actually collect the stuff from it, eventually it will stop producing and then the lifespan ticker will keep on going and it will you know, die on you. And then you will get very little out of your investment in harvesting it. So I recommend you check those things immediately when you log in to make sure you're not leaving any useful stuff sort of gathering dust. Then we have our little uh, uh, stall here, which is represented by this wooden cart. It's where you sell things to other players. If anything had sold, I would be able to see the word sold next to it on the right. Uh, this might mean that I have some stuff set for too high prices, which, okay, you know... Um, Sometimes you have to be aware the market changes on you and your stuff won't sell for a little while, but that's okay. Um, you do want to check that frequently as well. So the stash game itself is named for this treasure chest in your base of operations. And this is what holds all of your stuff. Okay, You have your personal inventory here, which is what you're carrying around, and then all the junk that you're holding on to over here. And this is your sort of general trash drawer in your kitchen of stuff um, that you're hanging on to either to use later or hoping that you can sell or you know that is necessary for crafting that sort of thing and your personal inventory you want to carry around the things you're going to need as you wander around in the gaming environment um, let's see do i have enough stuff to upgrade this no i am shy some nails so i will not be able to upgrade this 
what can I do to make room since I just harvested a paca? Hmm. Oh, well, I guess another paca gets to bite the dust to make room for the latest paca. Boof! And now I've just gotten that paca out of the stash and into the coop. And I can stick this other extra paca into the coop. So now I'm good. So you only have a certain amount of room there. And one of the things that you have to keep in mind when you're playing the game is that inventory space is a precious, precious asset. You don't start with very much of it. I believe your stash starts with only 20 spaces in it. I've expanded mine up to 72 over time. Uh, so it's got a lot more room in it than when I first started the game, but space is still at a premium because you can really accumulate a lot of stuff pretty quickly, um, you know, especially if you're out there gathering and getting in fights and collecting loot and that sort of thing, which, you know, in the end is sort of the goal. You want to amass lots of stuff so you can craft and you can get rich and all that other kind of thing. One of the really cool parts about this game is that it's not a hand-holding kind of game. I, I will call it that. I think that's the term the devs use, is they want to create a game where you're responsible for your own stuff and the economy is driven by the players and that sort of thing. So a lot of the game design ideas are sort of handled with that goal in mind, where the players control most of what happens in the game. So there's no real huge auction house, right, where you have stuff that sits for sale forever and is organized by price and type and that sort of thing. The closest thing you have to it is the newspaper, which looks like this. So you can see some random ads. It basically uh, takes a look at all the stuff people have put in those little carts, like the wooden cart that I, I showed you a few minutes ago. And it takes this huge list and it sorts out a certain number of them, like 360 of them is the current number, from all the different categories of stuff. And when I open the newspaper, I might see a completely different list of stuff than you do. And maybe more of what I see will be crafting materials, and more of what you see will be armor that people have made, that kind of thing. So you never know what you're going to get in the newspaper, but it does rotate its contents every five minutes from the time you open it. So if I don't like what I'm seeing here and it's not showing me the things that I want to buy by flipping through the pages with this little sort of turned up corner down here, I can wait a few minutes and come back and there will be a different list of stuff. Okay, but there's no massive auction house where you can just see everything anybody's ever put up for sale uh, or place bids or anything like that, those types of things. It's not EVE Online, you know? Um, and the reason this was designed into the game is that you can trade directly with people as you walk around. You can talk in the chat rooms, in the trade chat, uh, bargain, haggle, all that kind of stuff. You know, take custom orders from people as they need them. And this makes the economy very player driven, which is really what they wanted to do. So it's, um, it's a design concept you'll see reflected in almost every facet of how the game operates. There is no starter quest line that teaches you all the ins and outs of the game. There is a uh, helpful guide that you can get to, and I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't point this out. If you go to the help button down here, the little question mark, there is a really neat guide made by one of the players here called Karazhan's Guide to Stash, which will tell you just about everything you need to know to get launched in the game, okay? And anybody who's a new player, absolutely look at it. It will tell you the answers to 99% of the things you might ask as a new player. Uh, so if, you, if you're getting started in the game, start with that document. It will save you a lot of time. It will save you a lot of asking questions in Stash, uh, basic chat, and you will just get underway so much faster by using that guide. Okay, so let's get back out into the main area of the game, which is called the overworld. So we'll pop uh, this here, boop, and out we go to the overworld. Now this is the main city, Askegard. It's where the very few number of NPC merchants can be found, and the inn, which is a place you can stand around and heal over time both your health bar, which is this green thing up here, and your mana bar, which is the blue thing down here. <coughs> um, hmm, I seem to have 116% mana. I don't know how that happened, but I won't complain. <coughs> um, the game is still under development, so you will see occasional oddities like that. That might be because I was running a, a boost 
not too long ago that gave me extra mana and I haven't spent it down yet so that may be why you're seeing that. Uh, right now what I want to do is go into the city and visit the inn because in addition to healing um, that is where people typically gather to exchange buffs which can give you stat increases and uh, generally make your adventuring life a ton easier as you go out into the world. So let's stop off at the inn and see who's hanging around. Okay, so we have a decent number of people here. I don't know if all of them are active or if some of them are away from the keys, but I'm going to start uh, throwing some buffs around and hopefully people will respond in kind by pumping out, whoops, I missed, by pumping out some buffs in my direction as well. So let's see, got one and whoops, ah, eh, my mouse aim is horrible tonight. I, uh, I have not been drinking, I promise, um, <laughs> but uh, you have to be careful when you're aiming here because if you don't have the person highlighted when you click the button, you get a clean miss. So I'm going to try to give everybody here a buff and the kind and generous people around will respond by giving buffs back if they're able. And I'll help my cause out a little bit by going into the stash chat and just blatantly asking for buffs. So let's see. Hi, every... If I could spell, that would help. Everyone, can I get some buffs at the inn, please? And see who responds. So I got one already. You can see the little icon for it here. It gave me a bonus to my dexterity, which uh, helps rangers with their powers, and it helps determine what order you act in in combat. So more dex means you go sooner. And luck, which has to do with things like, uh, will you succeed when you're trying to harvest a resource? Will you get better loot when you win a fight? That sort of thing. So it's a general purpose, you know, things tend to go better for you kind of stat, which never hurts to have. Uh, let's see. So I have my buff that I just put on myself, which gives me more intellect, which... If you're familiar with role-playing games at all, generally is the stat that mages want. It makes you hit harder, that sort of thing. And extra mana, which gives you more energy to cast spells with, which again, as a mage, is very useful because I'm not one of these people who runs around with a giant sword and shield and, you know, just pokes the sharp end into things to do my job. I need to zap things at a distance. So let's see. Uh, is there anyone else who will give buffs? Let's see. Can I get a fortitude, fortitude buff at the inn, comma, please? Remember your Oxford commas. They're the rage in the grammar circles. Um, because, hey, let's not have any confusion in language. So let's see. Okay. Now, there are uh, several different classes in the game and several different races. Oh, wait, look, somebody gave me the fortitude buff. Thank you. Um, let me just explain that real quick. That gives you extra strength, which is a stat that only really benefits warriors. It makes their um, special abilities hit harder. And constitution, which gives you more hit points. Okay, so there are four classes. You have the elementalists, like me, who go around zapping spells into things. You have warriors, which are exactly what you would imagine. They poke sharp things into other people and monsters and things like that. Uh, you have hunters, which shoot sharp pointy things at other monsters and you have uh, your healers which are exactly what you would expect from any MMO with a healer they wear moderate armor they club things they heal people and they can do some exceptionally nice buffs which is always a perk particularly if you're in a party um, they are one of the best classes to play if you're a solo player because you have the built-in ability to keep yourself alive when other people might struggle to do that. Plus, because you can wear some decent armor, you're a little bit tankier than some of the other classes, and that lends a bit of survival uh, capability as well. <clears throat> okay, now you just saw some numbers, if you were watching, sort of float up from the people here. Those were the number of hit points and mana that you get back by standing around the inn. Uh, usually, if memory serves, that's 10% of your total for every 60 seconds that you're standing around here. <laughs> Ooh, excuse me for the sniffle, doing basically nothing uh, aside from swapping buffs and uh, talking to people and that sort of thing. So let's head out. Uh, I have most of my stuff back and these buffs last for exactly an hour and we've been sitting around a little bit here so the clock is ticking. Okay, 
Now, as a, a potion maker or an alchemist, I have a perk that other uh, classes don't get. These are crafting classes I'm talking about, which is I can make a potion, boop, that will give me a buff as well to that old intellect or any other stat that I choose. So that's kind of nice, and it also gives me the ability to do healing and mana recovery potions, which are usable in combat. Now that's a nice perk, because if you go to one of the merchants, um, what you see here is they mostly sell food, and food items will bring back uh, a bit of health, a bit of mana, and they'll have a stat listed there. This one says, basic street meat. This conglomeration of meats is sold by street vendors. This is a strength enhancing food. Quality 75%, health restore 155, mana restore 6, uh, level 10, value 10. What that means is, if you have not maxed out your strength stat, every time you eat this, it begins improving your strength until you reach that maximum value. Uh, this potion is a, uh, an NPC vendor potion, which means its quality is not as high as a player-made food item would be, um, but it does still restore a decent amount of health. It's mostly a health-restoring food and a tiny bit of mana. Then you have the street drumstick, which is very similar, except that it enhances dexterity and does slightly less health, but slightly more mana. Now your go-to foods, and the ones you're always gonna wanna have in your personal inventory, are the potatoes and the fish, because potatoes are all about health restoration and they give you the most health back and the fish because they are a straight up mana restore um, and they give you the most of that so these are your two most important normal like carry them with you all the time foods and what i find is very effective is to carry some of those right so that every time you exit from a fight you can restore the stats you need in particular um, but also carry a third kind of food if you need to boost a particular stat uh, and use that primarily after each fight until it's gone and supplement it with these sort of go-to foods. Uh, so the strength and dex ones are here. The potatoes give you constitution which um, increases your maximum hit point pool and fish gives you intelligence or intellect which is my character's primary stat anyway so that works out really well. Um, if you are trying to play a tanky character or an alchemist, these two primary foods are very valuable to you. So then we'll go over here to this other vendor, because this one sells a little bit different uh, group of foods. This one gives you a plus charisma uh, food source, which if you take a look has the same basic health restore and mana restore as some of the other foods you can buy. The pasta, which gives you luck, and the eggs, which give you will. Okay, now they give you a bit less of the health, maybe two-thirds or half as much health as some of the other foods, but a lot more mana. So that's a nice one as well. Um, when you're a spellcaster, intel uh, intelligence or intellect and mana are very important because both of those, in addition to everything else they do, increase your total mana pool, which means when you have those stats nice and high, you can, you know, cast, cast, cast for a lot longer time without the batteries running out on your spells. So that's kind of neat. Um, also, most of the uh, vendors down here will sell traps and bait to catch pockets. So if you want to keep that chicken coop filled, that's the tool you use. Okay, and finally, we have this vendor down here, which is the one that provides your basic tools and crafting tables for all the different crafting skills. So you'll find tools, right? There are six of those because there are six crafting skills. And then you'll have the crafting tables and various uh, specialty items that you put either inside your uh, base of operations house or in the front yard outside your base of operations. Um, and then you have these gathering tools at the bottom. <coughs> there are six main resources that you can gather and each one corresponds to one of these tools. Um, the pickaxe is for mining metallic ores. The pick is for digging gems up. So you got to make sure you have the right one of those. The, the axes are, not surprisingly, for cutting down wood. Uh, shears are for gathering herbs and plants. The knife is for skinning leather off of animals that you have, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but smushed. And scissors are for gathering the cloth from the armor of your defeated enemies. 
So you should carry all six of those either in your inventory or equipped. And it's important to know which ones you should use as your equipped ones. And let's, oops, wrong button. Uh, where is it? Do, 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 inventory. Okay. You can only have two tools actually equipped at any moment. And the reason that this is important is that when you're in a dungeon and in a fight, sometimes in the combat screen there will be resource nodes available. And you can only gather the resources that you have tools for in these two little spots. Now, when you're walking around the overworld, it's just assumed that you will pull out from your backpack whichever tool is appropriate for the uh, resource you're trying to gather. But um, because dungeons are limited, it makes selecting these two tools very, very important. Most people go with the logic that whatever their crafting talent is, they'll equip the tools that are most often used to gather materials for that crafting talent. And that's a very solid bit of logic. You can definitely go with that. I use a different kind of logic, which you know can feel free to borrow if you think it makes sense to you. I use the two tools for gathering leather and cloth from defeated enemies because... I can gather the other stuff just walking around the overworld, but those two resources, cloth and leather, can only be gathered in the wild, so to speak, by winning fights. Okay, So I could gather gems anywhere. I don't have to wait for them to show up in a fight. I don't have to wait for metallic ores to show up in a fight. I can just walk around in the outside world, and they'll just be laying there waiting for me to pick them up. The skinning tool and the cloth gathering tool, you have to win fights for. So I keep those two equipped for the one circumstance in which you can only really get those resources by doing. Um, so let's take a quick look around. And if I walk not even a very far distance, I would bet you dimes to donuts I'll start seeing resource nodes just laying around on the ground. And there is one right now. This uh, blue gem is called Carbonics. And it's very valuable. People seem to really need a lot of it. And it doesn't seem to be as plentiful as the demand for it actually is. So I go around and I pick this stuff up anytime I see it because it's like nuclear reactor fuel. It's expensive, it's rare, it's hard to get in large amounts. And because of that, you can sell it for ridiculous amounts of money if you don't use it yourself. These uh, rocks with little sparkles on them are uh, metallic ore nodes. And you see I'm not actually switching the equipment in my inventory. It's just sort of pulling out the right tool all by itself to gather these things. The one thing you will not see laying around, so we've just gotten some gems, some ore, here's some wood. The, the only things you will not find like this are leathers and cloth. So that's why I keep those two equipped because when you're doing a, a combat and a corpse is laying there and it's got some leather or some... Uh, cloth that you can loot from the corpse. It's the only time you're getting it, and I don't want to be sitting there getting a message saying, sorry, you have the wrong tool equipped, which is basically what it says, uh, if I try to harvest it. So the area we're in right now is called the Overworld, and it's designed to sort of have the look and feel that you might find in a tabletop RPG at your local hobby shop where somebody's built one of those uh, tables out of a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood and put some flocking on it to represent grass and some you know, brown painted stuff to indicate paths and such like that. Um, it does have animated water, which is kind of cool, but th that's the aesthetic that they're going for, is uh, this tabletop hobby shop, you know, we're all hanging out and doing this old school kind of feel. And I think the art aesthetic here really carries it. Uh, you know, you see the trees look like that, the grass looks like that, the water looks like the kind of stuff you would see in a homemade gaming table. And it really pulls off that whole aesthetic very, very well. And I like it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, as the name suggests, uh, an old guy gamer. I've been playing games since the Atari 2600 days. And when the Dungeons & Dragons game was in a boxed purple, you know, cardboard box that said basic rules on it, you know, from way, way, way back. And um, I love this aesthetic. It looks fun. It's reminiscent of, you know, the, the gaming that I grew up with. So it's, it's really just a cool way to make the game look. Now, if you'll notice, I'm not running around looking for quest givers. 
that kind of goes with what I was talking about before on how the game is not about holding your hand. Uh, from having played for a while, I know that in order for me to craft, I have to gather resources, I have to go and get into combat and all that kind of good stuff. So I'm going around and doing that. But there's no sign in the dirt saying this way to resources or dungeon here. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like that. You have to explore and you have to find things that are important to you all under your own power. And that's kind of cool as well because while it does have a bit of a learning curve, it definitely gives you a sense of accomplishment when you find the things you need, when you gather the resources you're, you're going to use for crafting without somebody else sort of paving the way for you. There's a greater sense of accomplishment, and I think that's pretty cool. So there are certain dungeons that are in the same place all the time. This is one of them. It's a, it's a world dungeon called the Ruined Barracks, and that's nice to have around because um, the monsters in it respawn frequently. They are, you know, of a generally consistent level range. And there's a boss monster in there that you and a group of people can fight for a pretty significant chunk of experience points and some pretty good loot as well. Um, if you're within the right level range for that dungeon, I wouldn't recommend trying to solo the boss the first time uh, because you'll end up, you know, pancaked into the ground. And that's never a fun experience because then you end up with what's called experience point debt, um, which very much like having student loans is tedious and painful and not at all enjoyable, except for the fact that if you accumulate more of it than anybody else, you actually can top a leaderboard for XP debt and get rewards for it every so often. Um, now this is my experience point bar. Uh, in order to get to a certain level, you have to get 100% of the experience needed for that. And each one of these little diamonds represents 10% of that. So you have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and then the last 10% is shown by the bar. So each time this bar fills in, you get another diamond until you hit 100%, and then you go up a level. The red there is not usually present unless you're carrying XP debt. And what that means is for every two points of experience you earn, one of them goes to paying off that debt and the other goes to your advancement. So the net effect of that is it slows down your level progression by half until you pay off that debt. And that hurts. Um, I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world. You know, it's not like you uh, can't overcome it. But it is something that slows down the grind, you know what I mean? So, avoid it if you can. Um, you accumulate experience debt in two ways. One is by dying in combat, so obviously avoiding dying is helpful. And the other is by uh, running away from combat successfully so that you don't die. And if you successfully run away, you get basically one-tenth as much experience point debt as you would if you actually got flattened by the enemy. So you want to avoid getting flattened, run away if you feel like you're really about to lose, and you'll spare yourself as much of that painful XP debt as you can. You're not always going to be successful at fleeing, but it's certainly better than just accepting a ten times higher XP debt because you didn't want to take the chance. That's, uh, uh, you know, sort of just a matter of practicality. All right, so as you wander around, in addition to these resource nodes I've been showing you, um, what you'll see is that there are monsters sort of, uh, you know, littering the landscape, for lack of a better word. They're shown by these little squares, and the type of monster gives you some idea of what uh, you'll see in there. So this is a water elemental encounter. That means there will be some water elementals in it, and they'll be the most common monster. Sometimes they'll be the only kind that you'll encounter in there, but not necessarily. Uh, you, there will frequently be a mix of enemies in a fight that you walk into, um, but there will always be more of whatever this little picture indicates than any other kind in that encounter. So this one will have mostly water elementals, this one will have mostly dust elementals, this one will have mostly bats in it, and that's how that works. The little diamonds at the corner of these square bases tell you just how dangerous the encounter is. So the gray ones are very, very much below your level. Okay? Then you'll have some green ones, which are still below your level but closer to it. Blue ones, which are almost at your level. White ones, which are exactly at your level. 
Um, yellow ones, which are a little bit higher than your level. Red ones, which are significantly higher than your level. And purple ones, which are basically, you might as well start hitting the flea button now because you're about to get turned into jelly. So I recommend avoiding <laughs> the purple ones for the time being. Uh, while you're learning the game in particular. I mean, I've got a pretty decent handle on how combat works at this point, and I don't intentionally go after purple combat at all. Um, I like living. <laughs> so, you know, you avoid the purples, and you'll tend to survive more. That doesn't mean you'll always be successful, because, you know, also hiding around the landscape are invisible encounters that are called either surprise encounters or ambushes, depending on who you're talking to. Um, they are sort of like landmines. You can't see them, but if you walk over them, you're launched directly into combat and you have no choice but to figure out how you're going to cope with it. Fight and hope you win, flee, uh, you know, you can try and gauge how difficult the encounter is going to be before you make that decision, <clears throat> but um, you're stuck. <laughs> you know, once one of those landmines goes off underneath you and launches you into combat, you have to deal with it. You can't just decide you didn't want to have that fight. So keep in mind that the further you go away from the city, which is your beginner area, the more dangerous these encounters will tend to be. Like if you notice, behind me there's one that's a grayish, whitish color, which means it's or definitely gray, excuse me, which means it's significantly lower than my level. And then you have a green one, which is still lower level than me, but getting a little bit less friendly. And then as you go further and further away, you'd find, you know, if I were to go down there or follow the edge of the island, that these things would become rapidly more and more dangerous. Okay, so there are two kinds of dungeons around there. And one of them is a world dungeon, which we talked a little bit about. By the way, unrelated note, iced tea is delicious. Um, <clears throat> private dungeons and world dungeons. World dungeons have monsters that respawn frequently. They have the bosses and anybody can wander into them any time. Private dungeons, when you go into them, you go into an instance that's just for you and your party, and the monsters don't respawn. Once you clear it out and you leave, there's a half hour sort of cooldown time on it, during which the monsters are just not going to be there. You can skirt that by exiting from the game and, and coming back, or just going to the character selection screen and coming back, and that will refresh the settings for all the private dungeons for you. Um, but that's, you know, sort of a not uh, designed in feature, it's just sort of how it works right now. And eventually I'm assuming the developers will find another way to deal with that respawning. So as long as we have some buffs going, why don't we go into a dungeon and see what we can find. Okay, so if you notice, just like in the overworld, there's no mini-map, there's no compass, you don't have much in the way of uh, an indicator of which direction you're facing, and if the dungeon gets too much bigger, it's not that hard to get lost while you're walking around in it. And again, that's pretty much by design. They want you to not have your hand held. Uh, so let's see, we're going to take a look at this guy since he's right next to the exit arrow. Um, this one is white. You can see the word encounter is bright white. That means it's at my level. And the monsters are called gobos which, not surprisingly, means they're goblins. Um, they can walk up and smack you. They can throw little flaming grenade-type things at you. Um, they actually can hit fairly hard, which can come as something of a shock, but they're not all that fast, which is very helpful to know. Uh, these skeletons are also not all that fast. So the first thing you want to do is look and make sure that these are all normals. You can see it says Gobbo Pint, 12 indicating the level and then normal if it says lieutenant elite or champion they're going to hit a lot harder they're going to do a lot more damage and they're just generally going to be kind of a big pain in the rear end so if you do have what i'll call uh officer class enemies you really should consider uh focusing them down <laughs> as early as possible uh if it's convenient for you to do that to keep them from sort of ruining your day with their high damage output and uh, sort of dragging this health bar ever closer to the holy cow you've got experience debt level of damage. So right now I'm just actually using my staff as a clubbing stick because I did an area of effect spell on them as we were going through and that reduced those two gobos to having very little hit points. This guy is still at full health 
I'm going to take advantage of the fact that he's slow. I'm going to run away, and I'm going to throw some fire over my shoulder at him. He'll be able to move one, two, three, and close in on me. But if I had more space, and it's good practice just to do this by habit, you know, even if it's not going to work in that particular circumstance, to try and put distance between you and any slow-moving enemies. Um, it's just a good tactic, and it can save you from taking a lot of hit point damage. So when you're done, sometimes the uh, corpses will have little glowing motes over them, like those resource nodes. That indicates they can either be harvested for the cloth in their armor or for their leather. Uh, we don't have any good luck in that for this fight, so we're just going to go to the treasure chest. I could get a recipe, which I can't use yet, uh, a shield, which I can't use, or a red brick, which is something that you use to improve the size of your house in your base of operations. So I'll take that any day of the week. Now we'll wander around here, put ourselves out of any particular combat, and then we'll go to this use menu. And you'll see I have the fish, which gives me back some of that yummy, yummy mana. And then this is the potatoes, which will give me back health. Now I'm back up to full power, and it's time to go and lay the smack down on this other gobbo. Okay, here we go. Let's see what we see. So now we have two gobbos and a bat. Bats are fast. They can go, I believe, five squares. They're very, very quick. Let's see. We have a normal one, a normal one, and a normal. So we're good on that. Uh, I think I am going to fall back a little bit here and throw a spell at the bat. I don't have a particular reason to choose one enemy over the other right now, but as you can see, these guys can throw stuff from a distance and hurt you. Uh, my thinking here is if I can let them close in until they're in a nice tight package, I can hit an AoE spell or area of effect spell on them and hopefully take out more than one at a time. So I'll leave this guy, this bat, injured, leave this gobbo injured, and the bat will come right over to me because that's the only way it can attack. And now they're in a nice tight cluster. So I can use this area of effect spell, which hits kind of a tic-tac-toe board shape of stuff, and I center it on this guy. Luckily, your spells do not hurt yourself. And these two should be done for, leaving only this one partially alive to finish off next round. Okay, so... This guy is flattened, that guy is flattened, and this one only has 66 hit points left. I don't even need to waste mana on finishing him off. Bop with the staff, and away he goes. Okay. And once again, my luck is bad. I do not have any harvestable stuff on my fallen enemies, so we go right to the treasure chest. Sometimes you have to rotate the map a little bit to get the chest to recognize that you're actually uh, you know, clicking on it properly. So here we have some stone blocks, which are also used to improve the base of operations. More red brick. And a carbonyx dagger. And you'll see it has a, an effect on it that says damage plus 8. That means it's enchanted, and that means I can throw it into my disenchanter machine, which is essentially a recycling box. And that will give me special materials that I need for one of my crafting skills. Okay. So let's go and heal up a little bit, get back a little mana, get back a little health, and oh look, some more gobos. Let's take care of them. All right, so only two enemies this time. Let's take a look at them. We have a normal one and a normal. We've been very lucky in getting fairly light duty opponents, so I'm going to head this direction. And one thing I know is that elementals of this type that look like the little pyramids floating along, they are very vulnerable to electricity, and I have a very easy-to-cast spell called Zap 1. So, bop, and he is just gone. He just got tasered into next week. I can just picture him, don't tase me, bro, and I'm like, oh, no, I have to do it, you know. So, okay, here's another thing to keep in mind. There's a solid obstacle here, and then there's an enemy, and then there's me. Since I have him trapped between me and a solid obstacle, he is what's called pinned. And if I swing my sword at him, you'll see it'll say pinned in a second when he tries to swing back. And that means he does less damage to me. So if you can pin opponents against a wall or other solid obstacle, it makes them less harmful to you. And that can become very important, particularly if they're a high damage output enemy. So you definitely want to capitalize on that when you can. Also, 
<laughs> I feel I would be remiss if I don't tell everybody it works against you too. <laughs> so you don't want that to happen. Okay, nails, once again, a building material that you can use to improve your base of operations. Um, these weapons do not appear to have any enchantments on them, so I don't need them. And then there's a recipe. Now, if I had my one crafting skill called armor, or if I had that skill, excuse me, at level 10, I would want this because it would improve the range of things that I can build, but I don't actually have that skill. I have alchemy, I have maker, which is sort of a general tool building and furniture building uh, skill, and I have enchantment. Okay, so once again, we take a moment. Now you'll notice I'm not going to finish healing the uh, mana bar all the way to the top. That's because I don't usually use all my mana in any given fight. Um, I have a mix of spells on my actions bar, uh, some of which only use five mana at a time, which means I can cast a lot of repetitions of those without it even being close to running me down in terms of uh, my total mana. So I'm not going to worry about that for now, because healing that tiny amount of mana would be wasteful, because the food would actually sort of heal it out to here, which means I'd be wasting a lot of that food's mana recovery potential. Okay, so I've led them into dog piling on me here, or bat piling on me. Now let's take a quick look. Oh, that one's a lieutenant. You see how many hit points he has? 331 out of 520. The other guys have only 260, so he has literally twice as many hit points as they do. Normally, I would want to do the area of effect item, but since he's a big bad, I'm going to drop a big spell on him in hopes of reducing his threat to me. So I cast a big damage spell on him, and now he'll take a lot of damage from it, and he's got a sort of a, a debuff on him that makes him take damage over time. And these guys are still in a nice dense pack, so I can still drop the area of effect, finish off the lieutenant guy, and damage the other two opponents. But you notice how low my health bar has been getting because I've been coping with these guys? Uh, that's what you kind of want to avoid. <clears throat> Normally I'd be fleeing from them, but these guys are simply faster than I am, so there's not a huge amount of point in doing it, aside from trying to reduce that surrounded statement, which means I'm dealing less damage outbound uh, because I'm surrounded by enemies. However, getting rid of that lieutenant was more important to me than jockeying for position. Okay, so this is one of those corpses with the little glowing moats over it. That means it can be harvested for cloth or leather. And let's see, I got one shabby leather off of it. If you do find a corpse like that and you take the turn to harvest it while the fight is still going on, you get double the reward for it because of the risk you're taking. So if you're winning a fight pretty handily, it's very worth it to get that extra bit of harvesting done. Okay, so red brick, always useful. Recipes for stuff I can't make, don't care. Club and uh, sword that I can't use, don't care. And done. Moving right along. Oh, look, more iced tea? Why, thank you. I don't mind if I do. Oh, yes, iced tea, the drink of champions. Okay, so before I get into another fight, I definitely want to heal. Let's get that health back. And I expended quite a bit of mana because I used some particularly powerful spells in that fight. Um, the high damage one that does damage over time and the area of effect use a lot of energy. Now remember I said earlier you can sometimes find resource nodes in combat? These are herb resource nodes. If I had the herb harvesting uh, shears, I think is the tool for that, I would be able to harvest those right now and I'd get you know, uh, an opportunity to harvest eight times. Uh, that would be normally very worth it, but they don't show up a lot. And, as I said before, you can find herbs just walking around the overworld. Okay, so these guys are slow. One, two, three, four. If I keep at least four spaces between them and me... One, two, three, four. Good. I should be able to make sure they can't hit me next turn. And those guys are both normals, so I don't have a huge threat coming from them. And now because they closed in, I can use this uh, blue area of effect spell on them, and it will finish off the one guy that I damaged the first round and leave the other one as an easy finisher next time. And here's the club. She winds up, she swings. Home run! Okay. All right, and let's see what we get in our lucky treasure chest this time. Oh, I have to rotate a bit here. There we go. Uh, fire Essence. That's a specialty 
uh, crafting material that you, again, can only get by looting it, usually, uh, in combat. You don't need a special tool for it, because it shows up in the treasure chest, but it's always worth hanging on to it if you have the space in your inventory. Alright, so I don't really need to heal up much right now. I'm almost at full health, and I've got plenty of mana, so I'm just going to walk into this next fight. And looks like two enemies. So that it turns out to have been a good decision. Let's see. We have a normal one and another normal. So no lieutenants this time, no elites, no champions. That makes me happy. I'm going to move over toward this uh, pyramid-shaped guy. Give him a little tasering. And down he goes. And then the bat will come over here. Now if he had survived, I could have moved over here a bit, led them into that sort of dense pack that would have let me use the area of effect spell but it's not necessary since there's only one guy left I can use fairly light duty spells to polish him off bye bye Batsy okay do we get any harvestable stuff no the force is not with me but I do get essence there are essences of all the four cardinal elements from mythology earth air fire water so we'll take those and the big stone block and the sturdy shingles for improving the base of operations house later. How are we looking here? Looks like we have one, two, three, four more encounters till we clear out this dungeon. I'm going to give myself a little food boost and go after this skeleton. Okay, again, only two. Let's see how big and bad they are, however. Alright, so he's normal and he's a lieutenant. Notice again, 260 hit points on the gabo. And 520 on the skeleton. So we definitely want to lay a smack down on the skeleton. I'm going to do the retreating battle thing. My normal spells have a five square ring. So one, two, three, four, five. Should put distance enough between us that I can hit him at range. But he will not be able to walk up and smack me quite yet. This guy with his ranged attack can, however. All right. So now I can... Once again, move away. It's not going to be quite enough to keep the skeleton from catching me, but I might be able to move away from him next time, which is always a good thing when you're talking about an officer-level enemy. Now, because he's fairly low on health, I'm going to take a risk and use the area of effect spell on him and hope that that works out. I am going to move away a little bit, though, so I don't take the damage reduction from being surrounded. And cross your fingers. No whammy, no whammy, no whammy. Stop. Oh, and I got enough. Fantastic. Okay. Oh, and that guy can be harvested. Now, you see, I have, still have most of my hit points, and this is just a normal enemy. So I'm going to walk on over here and harvest this. And if I'm lucky, instead of a failure, I'll get two pieces of cloth from it. And there you go. Success, two torn cloth. And now this guy, I will just clonk with my staff, since he has only a few hit points left. Bonk, and away he goes. Oh, and he's harvestable too. Thank you, random number generator. I am happy with you now. Okay, at least for that fight. And let's see what we get in the treasure chest. So I get some furniture, which I don't need, and a recipe that I already have. So I can just skip that, take the experience points, and the cash. Okay, fantastic. What else we got going on here? Uh, no monsters behind me, so the next thing to do is going to be dealing with these bats. I will eat and get a little bit of hit points back, and I will eat and get some mana back because I was very low. It also looks like my potion buff has worn out, so I'm going to eat my vegetables, and now I get my extra 20 intellect. Potions last half as long as a conventional buff. Uh, because the potion is half an hour and my buffs have less than half an hour on, uh, I'll be able to finish out this combat and not have to worry about my major buffs running out before the potion does. Alright, looks like I move first. Uh, these guys are fast. This guy is slow. I'm going to get behind this guy and give him an old zap. He's a normal. And I took him out in one shot. Fantastic. Okay, so here comes bat number one. Here comes bat number two. And he's normal, he's normal. I will lay the area of effect down on them after I move away a little bit. Uh, just to avoid the damage reduction. And zappity zap, freeze, freeze, freeze. You are now refrigerated. Let's see what it does to them. 197, not bad. Enough that I can one-shot either one of them with just my big old clonky stick. So that's what I'm going to do. Clonk, one down, yay! 
Victory is mine! Okay. And... POW! And he's done for. Okay, do I get any lucky glowy things? No. Over to the treasure chest. More building materials. More flour. Flour is a nice thing to find for two reasons. Number one, it's usable by the chef crafting class. So if you want to sell it to them, they'll pay a decent amount for it usually. Um, or you can give it to people in your clan if you have one, because it's a very useful material for them. And secondly, it stacks, uh, I think, up to 99 units in one inventory space, and it sells for 15 coins per unit. So a single full stack of it can be worth a lot of money to you, and it doesn't take up a ton of space. And that makes it very nice as a, uh, a loot item in the game, because it doesn't overload your backpack while still being very, very valuable. Okay, here we have another elemental floating pyramid guy. Two of them. Okay, let's see what we have. We have lieutenant and normal. Which one's the lieutenant? Lieutenant's on the left. Okay. So the lieutenant's going to get my first zap of electricity. One, two, three, four, five. And... Do Zappity zap. Don't talk back. Okay. Um, now you see when I aim the mouse at him... It says uh, health 248 of 520, mana 32 out of 32, and then there's a little lightning bolt. That means he has been debuffed, and that means I can use this more powerful electronic or electrical spell on him. Uh, the debuff is called Shocked, and watch where you see the damage number this puts out. Boo! 500! Gotta love that. Um, they're vulnerable to electricity, so they just get flattened by it. I mean, it's, it's kind of sad. Um, I'll just zap this guy, and that's the end of that fight. Okay, that was easy. Uh, I like easy. You have about a 70% chance of getting the debuff onto an enemy when you use one of the uh, basic electric or fire or whatever spells, and those are the setup for using the stronger ones. Okay, so we have some essences we can take here. We have a staff that I don't need, and done. Okay, moving right along. We have some more bats. We're... Definitely having an attic kind of night here, where the bats are thick in the dungeon. Okay, so boop. Let's get this diseased bat. Luckily, there is no actual disease going on here. That's just a name for it. It would be so much creepier if it was actually diseased. I, I would find that kind of icky. All right, let's give him a little bonk to get him started. And then we have a normal and a lieutenant over here. So the lieutenant's going to easily reach me. But I've got some guys that are already hurt, so I'm just going to back off one, and I'm going to use the Area of Effect spell. But you see how much health damage I've taken already? That's the power of those Lieutenant guys. They are just very, very painful to, to cope with. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to finish off this other guy who doesn't have a ton of damage on him while moving away a little bit. Ooh, should I take the risk and harvest? I, I feel like I should take the risk. Let's do it. It's the worst that can happen. Okay, I got some extra stuff out of it. That's good. Now let's... Oop, ow. Okay. It was worth it. It was totally worth it. Okay, let's uh, clonk him. Get him done. Boop. And what does this guy have left? 285. Okay, that's going to take two turns to whack him no matter what I throw at him. So I'll back away a little bit. Throw some fire. Oh, yeah. And I move away again, trying to keep good habits going here. He is uh, on fire at the moment, so I can use the second level fire spell. It's not necessary, but he deserves it. He's just ugly. I do not like him, Sam. I am. I do not like dead bats and ham. Okay. So we'll go back over here, since he's glowy. And we will harvest that leather. And then off to the treasure chest. Okay, another big stone block. That's a building material for the base of operations and neither one of these guys has any enchantments on it so done okay what else we got left some more gobos fantastic i am beaten up really badly it's time to chow down one two three and four bingo okay get a little mana back there we go i ain't no mana back girl uh-huh okay and we go over to the gobos Ooh. Three bad guys. Okay. Let's hope none of them is a, an officer class. We have normal. Oh, a lieutenant. And a normal. Okay. 
All right. Let's retreat to the corner. And we'll throw a little fire into the lieutenant, get him started. And then hope these guys move in so that I can throw the area of effect on them. Oh, that's a little closer than I thought he was going to move, but I will have to cope with it. Uh-huh. Okay, let's go here. Did he get lit on fire? Yes, he did. Time for the big spell. Zonk. Bloop. Okay, so he's one-shottable. And the other guys will go down like a sack of potatoes once I get him out of the way. So that is my goal, is to get him out of the way. Let's hurt everybody. Because you always hurt the ones you love. Except I don't actually love these guys. I just want them gone from my universe. Okay. Whew. The lieutenant guy is, good, is down. And these two guys are just waiting for me to swing for the fences and knock them over the left field fence. Okay, here we go. And bonk. Booyah. Okay, he's done for. Oh, and he's glowy, so we can try and take something from him. Failed. Oh, the shame of it. All right. Uh, red bricks will take. I don't make weapons, so I don't need that. And I don't need that furniture. So, done. Okay. And I believe that is everything in this dungeon. So, we will head on back out of here toward the ladder. Because that's how you get out of these places. See, you, you climb up a ladder into a ceiling that you cannot see. <clears throat> but that's okay. As long as you know that the overworld is up there, you can just use that ladder. Alright, so I've gotten that. And here's some of that oh-so-valuable carbonics. So we'll get that while we're here, and then we'll head back to town to unload the inventory, and maybe do a little crafting. You know, maybe uh, drink some apple juice at the bar, or, you know, do whatever seems to be the most fun and entertaining. But first and foremost, you need to unload all this stuff from your backpack because it's cluttered now. See how much there is there? Look at this. Look at all this stuff. Look at it all. It's everywhere. Oh, my shoulders are killing me from carrying it. Man, I need some, some pack animals or a giant dude with a suitcase on wheels to follow me around and carry all this junk. Okay, whew. Luckily, my little potion dealer is strong. She can handle it. She's like, I work out. Uh-huh. That's right. Because she totally does. There's this. If there was a gym in this game, she would totally go there. Because that's how she rolls. Okay. Now, my stash is actually pretty full at the moment. So, let's see if I can even fit all this stuff in there. Uh, I go to the stash. Do, do, do. Go to the bottom of the list and start dumping things in there with a double click. Ooh, oh, no. Okay, let's see. Can I fit some torn cloth? Okay, keep going, keep going. Keep fitting stuff in there. Woohoo! Keep going, keep going. Okay. Whoops. So, I'm a little shy of space. That means I'm going to need to take some stuff out. And then I will put this carbonics dagger in there, because that I can feed into the recycler, which means it will get disintegrated, basically, and turned into something more useful, which should be able to fit into the stash chest. Mm. By the way, I've said before that iced tea is delicious. I highly recommend brewing it yourself instead of using, like, a giant thing of mix, because you can buy tea bags online real, real cheap, and just let it brew for, like, pour, put some hot water into a gallon uh, pitcher and let it brew for a couple hours. Then throw in some lemon, a little bit of sugar, and you're just good to go. All right. Twinkling dust is a useful uh, crafting material. So we've turned that uh, useless dagger into something I can actually use later. And then we can put this leather in here and hopefully the paca, and now we're back to full. But the wooden plank will not fit which is a crying shame. Oh, look, eggs! You know what we have to do now. Dun, dun, dun. Wow, holy cow. That was one productive dead chicken. All right, and the pocket goes in there. And now we can take this plank and put it into the space that was vacated by the poor demised pocket. Okay, so let's see what else we have. Uh, we have a couple apples we can collect. 
and we have some carrots and wheat, which is also good. And now we take a look and see what we can craft. Do I have the right materials to make potions right now? Oh, I can make one extra buff potion for what I usually use, so that's good. Craft, and that'll take five minutes. It'll either turn into one of these or it will say alchemy disaster, which means that I botched it really badly. And then we'll look over here, and these uh, tables, these simple alchemist tables, are really great for training the skill because they generate a lot of experience in a very short period of time. They're only 30 seconds to craft, so that's good. We'll uh, make a few of those while we're waiting, and I'm going to see if any of my clan mates want any of the uh, stuff that I've been accumulating, because you want to try to donate to your clan because it's helpful to them, and they will sort of scratch your back later. Makes everybody kind of on the same page, all marching in the same direction, and you know, any other teamwork, metaphors, sports, go sports ball, you know, that kind of thing. And um, the clan gets stronger when everybody improves. So let's see. Go to the clan chat. Boop! And see, I know there's a chef on whose name is Mushy. So let's see. Hey, Mushy! Do you want more chef materials? Boop! And let's see. Oh, did that not work? What did I just do? Oh, I put it in the wrong chat. Ha <laughs> ha! See, I forgot to type slash clan. Hey, Mushy. Mushy. Do you want more chef materials? And let's see what Mushy has to say back. Because all the stuff that I'm gathering from the coop and the orchard and the tiny garden are all things Mushy can use, uh, as well as the flower that I picked up in the dungeon, which is a very weird place to pick up flower, but as I said, it's very valuable and takes up a tiny amount of space, so you keep it as much as possible. And let's see. No, not back from Mushy. Where are you talking to, Mushy? I need you to respond to me so I can give you stuff. Oh, definitely Pot. That's what they call me, Pot, because the character's name is Potion Dealer. Okay, meet me outside the Boo, or Base of Operation. So now I have to pull stuff back out of here, which is useful for Mushy. So Mushy can use the pocket meat. Mushy can use the flour. Mushy can use the wheat and the carrots and the apples and the eggs. Is there anything else that Mushy can use? Let's see. Any other foodly looking stuff in here? I don't think I have any other foodie type things going on. Uh, yep, looks pretty good. Okay. And let's go back outside. Hello. Okay. Now I just have to wait for Mushy to show up. And we will trade. Okay, Mushy. I am at the boo. And yes. Gems are always welcome. I have to adjust the super awesome hat. Because, you know, when you have a hat like this, you have to show it off. You just have to. Okay, so here comes Mushy. Mushy will probably wander on away from there and closer where I am, and then tree. Boop, there we go. All right, so let's see. Eggs, apples, carrots, wheat, flour, paca meat. Oh, and I get some of that rare sweet carbonics. Boop! Trade complete. All right. Thank you, Mushy. Your trade is appreciated and in my live stream. You were... Well, I wouldn't go as far as to say famous, but famous! So, there we go. Um, now we have some more stuff that we can use to craft, which is great. And we'll go back into the base of operations, collect these things. Okay, so that's a maker disaster. means that I botched that, but that's okay. I still get experience points for it, and that's the key. All right, let's go over to the other crafting table. How'd we do there? And I got a simple alchemist table out of it. Do I have space for it? Yes, I do. Craft, and we keep going. Okay, next, let's see... How we do with that carbonics? What do I want to do with that? I will go in here. This is inside my boo house. This is for processing uh, jute seed into spun thread. But if I go through this door, I have my little uh, enchanting table. So I will make a basic enchantment with some of that spiffy, spiffy carbonics. 
Oh, somebody's saying, do you stream mush? Or do you stream pot? Yes. My stream channel on Twitch is called Old Guy with a Joystick. Because that's how I roll. Okay, let's see. How are these coming along? Oh, another disaster. So that one got botched again. And here we go over to... Oh, another simple alchemist table. Fantastic. So things are proceeding here. Now, you may think that botching your crafting is just a horrible outcome, but it's not, okay? All those disasters can be fed into a recycling machine over in the city that looks like this gigantic steam engine, and it will return some nice rare crafting materials uh, as you do your thing, and uh, they can be used for making more and better stuff than just the materials that you get by wandering around. Oh, Mushy says, I'll oh, check it out. Uh, and the irony is he's playing on a keyboard. Yes, keyboards are cool. If I could spell, it would be even cooler. Okay, so let's see. What else have we got here? Okay, we go back into the base of operations to the little room with the alchemy table, or with the uh, enchanting table, and boop, carbonics enchantment, success. Well, I have enough to make one more, and that will not quite bring me over the threshold to going up a level in enchanter, but hey, what can you do? So I will have to gather more materials for that. What more materials do I need for that, actually, while I'm thinking about it? Oh, twinkling dust. That's one of the things that comes out of that little recycling box outside where I put the dagger. And I don't have any more weapons I, or armor that I can throw into this thing right now, so I will have to wait to make some more of those. But eventually, eventually, I will get there. Okay, retrieve and craft. And go to the other table and retrieve and, and click and, oh, come on, craft. Okay, there we go. Woo! All right, now we check the stash, stash ventory. And we will move those into my regular inventory. Why? Because we're going to sell them in the city. Um, they're worth 100 coin each. And they're nothing anybody can't buy from a regular uh, NPC merchant anyway. So they're useless to try to sell to another player. They're just useful for throwing into the hands of the uh, NPC merchants to get a little money back. And okay. Let's see how we're doing. Oh, oh, got another one. Can make two more attempts. So here we go. And we go over here. Retrieve. And craft. And now I'm out of materials I can use to make those, but that's okay. There's always more materials to get. So let's see. We'll check on the pacas. They're happy flapping their arms, that kind of thing. And no more stuff to harvest here. No more stuff to harvest here. Let's go check on that Carbonics enchantment, and I will put those up for sale when I am done here. Okay, let's go back outside, and are they ready? Yes, Alchemist Table, Retrieve, and you see how that turned into Italics? That means I can't make any more of those right now, I don't have enough materials. And another one here, and that one's also Italics, indicating it also recognizes that I do not have any more materials. Okay. So, I will now go over to, where is it, where is it, all the way down at the bottom, boop, table, 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 and some enchantments, okay. Let's see, let's ask the clan, what is the going rate for a Carbonics enchantment? Because I want to sell those, see? So we'll go to the old inventory here. We'll split that because I want to sell them one at a time. Here we go. And see if anybody has any idea what I should sell them for. I'm probably underpricing them, but you can't, you know, oh, sell two for 500. All right, I'll do these for 250 each. That sounds good. Let's try and undercut some people with 249. We'll do that irritating thing they do at stores by cutting it down by one and putting the nine on the end so it looks like it's enormously cheaper, but it really isn't. And then I'll throw an ad on one of these so it will hopefully show up in the newspaper. And then we can go off to the city to sell off all those tables that I just made. Hold on. Varus, okay, hold on. Isn't, possibly, isn't Varus the spy guy from Game of Thrones? 
Okay, now off to the city. All right, and then we'll just throw some of these things at the local merchants and get that out of my inventory so I will have room again. Oop. And then we will go off to the inn to heal up once that's done. So you go down to the bottom, you just start spamming that button, the mouse, or the mouse button, and done. Uh-oh, I forgot to put the extra carbonics into my... How could I have forgotten? I forgot to put the extra carbonics into my stash. Uh-oh, got to go back. Because, you know, it doesn't do me any good carrying it around in my pocket. <clears throat> it has to be in the stash chest. Because anything you want to craft, the materials for it, can't be in your personal inventory. They have to be actually in the stash. So that is a very important distinction. Let's quickly toss that carbonics back in here. Bonk, okay. Uh, let's see. Where's, uh, where's my irritating comment? There it is. We're going to scrap for them as long. Da, da, da. Okay, so nobody has responded yet. That's fine. And let's take a quick look and see. Is there... Oh, I can make more alchemist tables. Oh my gosh. I'm going to totally rock this and try and get to closer to another level here. Why? Because it's all about grinding. Well, okay, no, it's not. It's uh, all about having fun, but I really want to get to level 10 so I can do the level 10 recipes because that's where you start seeing some really neat stuff that you can make and, more importantly, stuff that people want to buy. Oh, look, somebody's typed a chat. I have been a very, very naughty, naughty host. Hi, back. I apologize. <laughs> For not not paying more attention to the chat window. There we go. Um, how are you doing? I want to try and interact with people because that's the polite thing to do. Okay, let's retrieve this and start another round of crafting and see if we get a response in the stream chat because that would be awesome. And if we don't, then you have my sincere apologies for having been a dunderhead and not noticing that you... Uh, had posted something in the chat until just now. I feel awful, just awful. Uh, and I don't want to leave you feeling like you were ignored because that's not okay. All right, let's see. Okay, keep the crafting going while we wait. And keep on retrieving. Okay, <clears throat> nine more to go after these. So, yeah, there is a little bit of a grind going on here. You have to wait for the clock to tick down, and you spend some time in your base of operations instead of out adventuring. But uh, in the long run, it's worth it. Uh, the game is still kind of in uh, an early development stage, even though it's released on Steam. Um, and lots of changes will be coming. And as the player base grows, anybody who's ahead of the curve by having you know, practice their crafting skills will be the primary sources people go to to buy the extra special stuff that they need, okay? So that's that's a very key thing to keep in mind. You definitely want to practice your crafting skill. Um, normally, a character can have only one crafting skill at a time. Uh, I have the Citizen download content, which gave me enough of the in-game uh, cash currency to get two more crafting slots. So I picked alchemy as my first one because I wanted to make potions, uh, as evidenced by my name. And I also picked the uh, uh, enchanter because they use some of the same crafting materials and they complement the, each other very nicely. And then maker because I wanted to be able to build furniture and kind of decorate my base of operations as time passes and make it look super awesome because, you know, bragging rights come from the cosmetics, if you know what I'm saying. Um, you know, it's all about how pretty your stuff looks. And I want to have the best looking base of operations ever. So I want to be able to build my own stuff. Okay, so a uh, little bit more crafting to do. Let's check on the food supply. So it's starting to fill up again. I'm not going to put it in there right now because I want the stash space for these tables that I'm making. <clears throat> As you can see, it's starting to fill up again, and I only have two more spaces here. So I'm going to quickly shift those over to the personal inventory where they can be sold. And that makes more room. Room is everything. Space is at a premium. <clears throat> now, uh, since I mentioned that, and we want to talk about space, um, we'll talk about how to upgrade things in the game. 
So let's say you're looking at your stash and you, th you started with 20 and you think, oh my gosh, that's not enough space. You can click upgrade and then those tw uh, the, the materials I was talking about, the bricks and the nails and such, you can expend some of those to improve the size of your stash. Or you can use these uh, in-game currency items, which are the ones that you buy for cash. Um, you can also use the uh, in-game currency or the cash currency to expand the number of bags that you can carry in your personal inventory. Um, space is definitely a key thing. Being able to manage your inventory can become a little bit of a challenge the more successful you get. So eventually you're going to want to improve the size of your stash. You're going to want to improve the size of your personal inventory. Um, and uh, just generally keep the progress of expanding your available space going as much as possible. When you do get the ability to carry extra bags, you can go look at the medallion shop, which is the cash shop, and look at storage. You can buy certain bags. Now you come with a six slot bag when you unlock a new bag slot in that inventory screen. Um, but you, you know, if you're gonna get bigger bags for it, they cost progressively more in-game cash, and the largest of them can only be bought for the cash currency. Now, if you have the means, it is absolutely worth it to get the most bang for your buck out of every one of those bag slots you have in your inventory. So I have the, the first one, which comes with that 24 uh, space bag, and then I have the first basic uh, bag that came with unlocking this slot. Now, here's the other trick to keep in mind. Um, each one of these, this cost 5,000 sort of non-cash coins, uh, to unlock. This one will cost 10000 and it keeps going up exponentially, so it becomes more and more and more expensive to improve the size of your personal inventory. Uh, so the game starts out free to play, but like any game, it does have to have certain ways it can make revenue, and one of them is by sort of charging for convenience. The game is absolutely not, and I want to stress not, pay to win, but it is something where you can purchase a bit of convenience for yourself in the cash shop. Um, you know, you can accomplish anything you really need to in the game without spending real-time cash, uh, but it is kind of nice to have the bigger inventory bags, um, you know, and there are some cosmetic items that you can get only for cash in the cash shop, but they don't make you hit harder or, or you know, be more durable, that sort of thing. Um, you, you can mostly do that stuff in-game, uh, and the cosmetics and the conveniences are what you really are looking at paying cash for if you want them. Now, I like conveniences, so I had a little bit of extra money on my Steam account, so I bought the Citizen Pack, uh, mainly because I really liked the game and the convenience seemed appropriate because I was definitely going to keep playing. Um, but uh, you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, I recommend it because I want to see people support the game because it's awesome, um, but nobody's going to twist your arm to do it. All right, do we have much more here? I think we're almost done with this round of crafting. Yes, we are. Okay, so about 30 seconds till those are done, and I can move some more tables back into the personal inventory. Okay, and as soon as those are done, I think I am good to go back to the city, uh, which I will do. Do, 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 almost done. Bink, another disaster. And what do we get? Oh, another disaster. Okay, so we'll collect that. And then we will go to move. Oh, I only got disasters. Okay, so let's look for disasters here. And I will show you how to recycle disasters in the city. Let's see, where are the disasters hiding? Where are you hiding? Hello, oh, there's some alchemy disasters. And then we have... Where are you? Maker disasters, okay. And I don't have a lot of enchanting disasters yet, but why not? Let's go and just recycle all of it. So, here's what we'll do. We'll head back into the city, and here we go, doo -doo -doo, back to town. And then we'll go over to the giant steam engine machine of recycling goodness. Okay, chugga 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 chugga, woo woo, steam engine, okay. Whoop, I want you to actually be able to see the whole thing, though, before I trigger it. Okay, now there it is. The mighty, mighty recycling machine, also known as the salvage machine or the giant steam engine. 
So what we do is we double click the alchemy disasters. It'll cost us 280 to run these and we click salvage. And now we wait. If you can play the Jeopardy theme in the background on your computer, I highly recommend it because it's very appropriate for this process, which can take a bit of time depending on how much stuff you are throwing in there. So I'm just going to drink a little bit of iced tea. Mm -mm -mm. And wait. And you should start seeing these guys go from being grayed out to actually having uh, brighter colors like that because the material is being salvaged from this. And it will usually drop by something like four items at a time and give you, well, hopefully, a little bit of stuff. There's no guarantee that each round will actually produce anything, like it just dropped by two and I didn't get anything new from it. Um, but if you're lucky, it will drop and give you more and more stuff. And these are all crafting materials as well that you cannot get in any way other than I mean, obviously you can buy them from other people who've done this, but uh, by crafting, having it fail, saving up the disasters, bringing them here to the city, paying the fee, and waiting for that to fill up. Okay, So that's how you get these special ingredients. This one is called Rare Goop. Uh, this one is called Legendary Goop, and I think uh, this one's fab yeah, Fabled Goop. All of different quality levels, and all used in different recipes. Um, and each one of the uh, crafting jobs, and there are six. You have uh, Alchemist, like me, that makes patient, uh, potions. Enchanter, like me, that makes improvements to gear. Um, you have Maker, like me, that makes tools and tables and furniture. You have Chef, that makes specialty foods, which can be much better than the ones you buy from the NPC vendors. You have Weaponsmiths, who not surprisingly make weapons. And you have Armorsmiths, who, again, not surprisingly make armor. Uh, each one of those has their own class of disaster uh, results and they all return these specialty uh, ingredients. So you definitely want to save all your disasters. I know that the first time you see it, if you don't know that, you just look at it and think, oh my gosh, it failed, I'm throwing that in the trash, and you drag it over to this little trash can here and you throw it away and then you learn how important it was and you kick yourself. Okay, So you don't want to walk around with a kick me sign on your back because that is some seriously grade school stuff right there. No. Save it. Be smart and uh, just think about saving. Saving, saving all the time. It's called Stash for a reason because you should be like a, a person hoarding everything you see. I am so serious. If you're not walking around with your shoulders creaking from the weight of all the junk you have collected, you're doing it wrong. Okay? So, you know, break your back doing it. Trust me, it's the right way to go. So now we'll retrieve this and we'll do the maker disasters. You notice it's less expensive. That's because I don't have as much stuff. Uh, it's usually five coins for every two items you throw into the machine. Um, hopefully this will not take as long as the last round. And since there's only three of those, hopefully that will take virtually no time at all. That's the, the hope. Now, a bit about how um, your character stats relate to this. Charisma is a stat that directly improves your chance of success when you're crafting, okay? So that means if your charisma is very high, which this character's is because when I chose her race, I got the one with the bonus to the charisma stat, it makes you get more successes when you craft. The downside to that is you actually need failures in order to get these specialty items. So if I had it all to do over again, I might not have gone with the same race for this one because sometimes having the failures is useful. Um, luck also kind of bears on this stuff. Uh, I don't have the specific numbers for how it works on it because the tooltips don't include that stuff. But if you talk to Snarlax, who's the head developer who hangs out in the, uh, in the chat rooms and he's usually available to talk, uh, he can probably describe it to you. The game has its own Discord channel, and he's frequently there, and will either chat with you by text, or sometimes they'll do voice chats, uh, and he's very good about helping people understand stuff. And that's very important, because like I said way back in the beginning of this stream, uh, the game is intended to be kind of a we're-not-going-to-hold-your-hand kind of thing, and that can leave you confused about how things work, and a lot of people find that a little shocking. You know, they, they uh, 
you you hand, hold their hand and they're great, but if you don't, everybody loses their mind, you know, as the Joker said in The Dark Knight. Um, but he'll help give you some explanations of the reasoning behind things, or in some cases talk about the numbers of how things work, and that can be very enlightening and it can help you to grasp the game better. Okay, so these disasters are done, and we have one more batch of only three, so hopefully that will not take too long. And pow, off we go. <clears throat> uh, let's see how long that takes to finish. And then uh, I should be able to dump that stuff back in the old stash. And fi finally, I keep talking about wanting to go back to the town to the inn to heal up, but I seem to keep coming up with more and new stuff to uh, actually keep me away from there. So we're, <laughs> we're going to hope that this is the last thing that comes to mind before I can head back to the inn and um, get this stuff going for the healing because it's looking a little unhealthy in potion dealer land right now. Okay, so we got one of these and we have one more of those to process. And so we got uh, the legendary enchanting gift, or grit, excuse me. Um, and uh, by the way, I kind of think it's pretty cool that they have these nice little tool tips. It says, found only after carefully combing through enchanting disasters, this legendary enchanting grit can be used to make high-end enchantments. And I'm thinking, yes, please, I'll take as many of those as you want to hand out. Okay, so now back to the stash. We'll drop that off. Goodbye, giant steam engine. There's the Rolling Stone in, because Papa was a rolling stone. Where he laid his head was his home. Okay. Do, 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 do. By the way, that little starting screen there where it loads in between zones with the little tower castle that looks like a stone lighthouse, that's actually a place that you can find. And if you uh, look me up on Steam, I actually have a screenshot of me standing there next to it. It's kind of funny seeing yourself in, you know, basically what looks like on the starter screen. Okay, so we have goop. More goop. More goop. Maker bolts. Enchanting grit. More maker bolts. More maker bolts. Oh, I forgot to sell these things while I'm in the city. Well, on the plus side, we were going back to the city anyway, so that works out all right. Uh, I will just not delay that any further because uh, delays are for the week. And we are strong. In Soviet Russia, game are very strong. And we want to uh, just finally wrap that stuff up. And here we go, here we go. And off to the merchant. Look at wares. Go down to the bottom. See, I go down to the bottom because if you double click, it keeps shuffling the list down so you don't have to keep moving the mouse when you sell stuff. Just be careful you don't get too enthusiastic and start selling off stuff you want to keep <clears throat> as you get down toward the uh, end of your list of saleable things. Okay. And off to the inn where I will hang out until healing. And in the meantime, I want to say thank you to everybody who showed up to watch tonight. Uh, it's really cool to have some people stopping by. Uh, I'm going to wrap up the stream here. So this is Old Guy with a Joystick, healing up at the inn and signing off.